It is I, Megatron. On behalf of TFYLP, I want to congratulate you for listening to the most refined collective podcast on this miserable little planet Earth. Yes. Here you'll find knowledgeable fans discussing every aspect of Transformers and beyond. Now, enjoy the show while I continue my path to complete conquest of all of you miserable biological entities. Predacons, terrorize! Two, one. Good evening, everybody, or morning, or afternoon, or who knows what time it is, because we're doing this as a pre-record. As Phil sucks at technology, so who knows when you're uh, watching slash listening to this. But uh, welcome to TFYLP. Uh, today is Thursday, June 13th, for those uh, who care. Uh, this is episode 7,957.83.124. Uh, tonight, I am joined by Anna. Good evening, day, night, time. And Piotr. Forever does, Tron. Or Destron, indeed. All right. So, thank you, folks, for uh, joining me. Which, uh, for for you know, us, it is evening. Um, not that we can tell with all the lightless, uh, windowless rooms that we tend to sit in to record the stuff. Um, but yeah, tonight we are here to talk about Transformers. So, uh, Peter, do you like Transformers? I do. I do. I'm a big fan. That's why I have Anna, all my GI like Joes behind me. I do like Transformers. Funny thing, when we were sitting here and you had us be quiet while the intro played, I was trying to remember what our intro song sounded like. And I got it playing in my head, except it wasn't actually our intro song. It was actually the music from the last fight of the Alexander Raid from Final Fantasy XIV, which was where you fight a combiner robot called Brute Justice, which is named after all of the robots from Bruticus. Because you fight Vortexer and Brawler and other robots named after it. And Final Fantasy XIV is a Japanese game that referenced Transformers. See the segue? Because was... tonight we're talking about Japanese Transformers media. I was just checking to see if you like Transformers and then we were going to end the show. Oh, no. I, I told okay. a story to get us to segue into a topic. That you came up with. That's true. Sure. Yes. So uh, to Anna's point, we are going to talk about uh, turning Japanese, um, which is ironic because uh, Transformers turned American. Uh, they were Japanese and then they turned American. And for a long time, we had dueling media. We had American cartoons. We had Japanese cartoons. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we, we got the original G1 series in both countries, and then it, it kind of ended here. There was times it splintered, it ended in the U.S., and then came back as Beast Wars, and then splintered again. And then it kind of merged into one thing. Um, we still got comic books and stuff from Japan, but, but it's been more and more of a homogenous sort of origin to a thing. So uh, after last week's episode focusing on Beast Wars Neo... I uh, wanted to have the discussion with with two very big fans of the Japanese Transformers media. So, uh, Peter and Anna, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Of course. Humorously, a friend of mine just came back from Japan, right? And she messaged me just like 30 minutes before we started the show. And she was like, Anna, I tried so hard to find any cool Transformers stuff to take pictures of while I was in Japan. I just couldn't find any evidence that Transformers exist in Japan. And I'm so confused because I know Transformers is from Japan. So I had to explain to her kind of this, you know, combination of brand unification, shift to adult audiences, and kind of, you know, this more Western focus in the media for the last few years to her. So I think it's a cool topic to talk about because it is something that, you know, has really kind of changed about the fandom. Because it's today we got the reveal of the um, Emerald Zaron and Flame 2 pack, right? And that reflects the time that we were getting U.S. media for Transformers, U.K. media for Transformers, and Japanese media for Transformers. And it's been very U.S.-centric for a little bit now. Like, that was a, that was a very different day back in the late 80s. Yeah, it, it is neat that Hasbro is integrating all of that into the line at this point. I think that is 
<laughs> something we kind of talked about, you know, back in the day with a line we'd want to see that just brought everything in together and legacy has done that. Um, but, but it is still a little sad that we're not getting new media from those other countries that, that it is this homogenous thing. Um, and it's still fun. It's still good. I still like what we're getting, but, you know, I think one of the characters I brought up, uh, Anna, when I was texting you about this earlier was Skybite. I mean, Skybite is not a character that we would have gotten here in the U.S. in, in that kind of format or version. And he is a beloved character that we did get in the U.S. because that was like one of the first times that we took a Japanese cartoon and just redubbed it and imported it here into the U.S. as its own U.S. cartoon on Fox Kids. Oh, I did not like that dub. But that, that's a personal bias. It yeah. was. It just made the whole feel of the series worse. And we're talking about car robots for anyone who didn't just immediately go, "Oh, sky bike car robots." Okay, right. We're talking about car robots, and the dub really changed the tone of the series. Plus, it was that like four kids and Fox Kids taking all of the Japanese media and really just like taking all the fun out of it. And then localizing it in bad ways there's a good way to localize media that weren't doing that back then <laughs> so i'll admit i'm a pretty big novice when it comes to the japanese media yeah, like i know the toys i know like you know i think they're cool i think they're awesome um you know but but you just talked about the difference anna between car robots versus robots in the skies with the dub being different like can you elaborate because i'm not sure i 100 percent know what the difference is it is i mean I have not watched all of the all of Car Robots since I was a kid. Or, well, okay, I was not a kid when it came out. I was a teenager. But I've not watched all of it since I was a teenager. But the tone was very, it was very anime. It was a little, a little along the lines of kind of like Super Sentai, almost more like kaiju, you know, like this really bombastic, wild series about the robots and battling and just kind of had a it had a very unique tone right like if you ever if you're ever curious go listen to the theme for car robots right the theme for car robots it gets you pumped it's energetic it's like you know definitely a period piece of music and it just makes you excited for something that's a very japanese kind of team fighting hero series and the I don't even know what to say that the English dub did with it. I mean, made it try to feel more like the American series, I guess. How would you I, summarize it, Peter? It kind of like... As far as tone goes, R.I.D. felt like um, like Digimon. Like They just, mm. they just took a, a Transformers cartoon... And made like, and I think it's some of the same voice cast. There was talented voice actors. I'm not bashing the voice cast. I'm I'm bashing the script in a lot of in a lot of cases uh, for the R.I.D. stuff. Uh, they they took the tone of Digimon and like you said, it was like a factory when the Fox Kids and Four Kids Entertainment stuff was just cranking out all those dubs in the late '90s, Monster Rancher and all that because everyone was trying to be the next Pokemon. They were trying to get some of that Pokemon money, and we'll get to Pokemon themed stuff later. Um, but yeah, R.I.D. felt like a quick cash grab. We've got this property. We're going to quickly dub it, crank it out, be done with it, and, and, and that's that. And it did, it did uh, eat away at, 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 at the tone and the fun and the flavor of Car Robot, which was unfortunate. Um, my local market didn't air R.I.D. when it was new. For whatever reason, the Fox Kids block got moved to Sunday, and half of it was chopped off. And... R.I.D. was part of the, the chopping block. Mm. So I didn't watch it until much, much later. I saw I saw uh, Car Robot first in its entirety uh, and caught oh, R.I.D. Wow. when I could and, you know, on YouTube and, and bad rips and all that stuff. And, uh, yeah, not, not good. Not good. It, I didn't watch it on YouTube in 2001. For the people in the comments that are like, YouTube didn't even exist <laughs> until 2007 and R.I.D. didn't show up on YouTube until 2011 when the DVDs from Britain came out and you don't even have the rights to get them on DVDs where you're at. I don't care. I don't care. All right? I watched Car Robot first and R.I.D. later. It happens. The end. Gosh, I, was, I don't know where the hell I was torrenting um, Car Robots from, but I was torrenting it from something. Like, I was getting it. <laughs> It took forever to get a single episode, and it was not really, like, 
I guess it was it was a fan dub or a fan sub, so it was not like the lowest quality subbing in a way, but like you know some of the choices they made with fonts and things back then were a little ridiculous. You get like giant letters, and sometimes they'd be Comic Sans all over, and it would just be it was a different time. But it was fun, you know, it kind of felt like you were doing something like special or elitist to be getting that stuff back then. It's like here we can say, oh, yeah, we watched the Japanese version before it came out. I remember getting all the um, getting all the robots in disguise figures and just like immediately discarding the packaging and be like their names are Super Fire Convoy and Speed Breaker and blah, blah, blah. I used their Japanese names to refer to them only because Mm -hmm. I only made it through a couple episodes of R.I.D. before I was just like this is not the series that I enjoyed (laughs) Yeah. so yeah it was there haven't been that many instances of this in Transformers where like a localization destroys something unless you want to get into the Omni dubs um, that were released for a few of the Japanese series, which those definitely made a mess out of things, but we don't usually count those as like mainstream media. Um, but this is mainstream media. This was how we got the series and it made a mess out of it and, you know, was a bummer. Yeah. And it's just, it's kind of interesting when you look at the flow of media here in the U S for transformers. So we went Beast Wars, it just in the, the, you know, kind of that second wave of media, we went Beast Wars, Beast Machines, which was a direct continuation of Beast Wars, and all CGI animated stuff, and then 2D cell animation, anime heavy influence, you know, robots in the skies. And, and it was just such a jarring sort of shift because, you know, Beast Machines, you know, was a bit of a heavier show. Beast Wars also a bit of a heavier show and then like to go to that pokemon digimon super sentai feel that robots in the skies have it's like all right uh, uh, these are cool toys and you know that was like the first time i got to own like a new like japanese trans japanese design transformer like i remember seeing that stuff online seeing the car robot designs online like oh my god these are amazing um and then for them to be released in the U.S. was like, this is great. And so I was gobbling it up. Um, but yeah, it was a really big tonal shift. Whereas you, you, you had the switch from CGI to animated when, when Japan went from Beast Wars to Beast Wars Second. Um, and again, went more of that anime tone. But, um, you know, what was that like, Peter, in terms of? your exposure to the two Japanese Beast Wars cartoons. I don't know what you mean. What was, what was it like for my, my exposure? Uh, I, uh, yeah, so, like, how did you get to see the Japanese Beast Wars cartoons? Uh, horrible uh, 22nd generation VHS dubs. Okay. Well after the fact, yeah. So Well, well after the fact, but, bef- but before the fan subs started coming out. Okay, so but, but after Beast Machines concurrent with i would say okay. i was i was watching beast wars second while beast machines was coming out and beast wars neo i, I said fan sub a moment ago and then fan dub because there was a fan dub project on att um and i was watching those and i kind of got into them and i kind of didn't there there were some talented people there and a lot of everyone was having fun so i appreciated that and and i appreciated the effort that we went into it because it was a big big lift uh for as much of it that was completed so it was neat to be able to, and, and, I, and I did the same thing with Headmasters, Master Force, and Victory in the, in the 90s. I had umpteenth generation VHS copies with no subs, no dubs, and I just watched it all. Because I don't know what's going on. I can figure out what's going on, but I don't know, I don't know what, what the details of what everyone's saying. But I just wanted to consume as much Transformers media as possible as soon as it came out relative to like when I discovered it, if that makes sense. So like... The, the 80s cartoons, you know, Gen 1 stuff, I consumed it as soon as I found out that I could get it from someone. And the, uh, the Beast Wars stuff, I consumed it as soon as it was available because people were sourcing it and making it available to weirdos like, like us. So you were watching two different sequel shows at the same time? Yeah. 
while watching the American version. Like I'm watching Beast Machines, which is a, an American story based on not those toys, but like other toys that are thematically from the spawned prequel Beast Wars. So it's like mesh, mesh brain, yeah, mush. So, so yeah, it just created mush brain. Is that was that your experience with that then? I live in a perpetual state of mush brain. I was going to say, has your brain been demushed? And I think the answer is no. Do you want to see my G.I. Joes? Or my Battle Beasts? I I, I do. Oh, yeah, Battle Beasts. Which is, again, a Japanese Transformers thing. Um, So let's, let's, I I feel like, you know, we kind of start a little bit with the end. Let's jump back to the beginning and talk about, you know, Scramble City. Is that like, that's like the first time that American and Japanese cartoon splintered correct we should we should talk about tatakai choroboto semitai okay? oh sure yeah so, yeah so transformers aired in america first the the marvel production stuff did their thing and, and shook up microchange and diaclone toys and and spat out the transformer story and the comic landed and then the cartoon landed in in the u.s and then in japan they Showed up later, 85, right? So in America, we were already into season two here with our stories. And in Japan, they took season one and season two, shook it up, made it one season, kind of mixed the episodes up. And that was all one season. Like, that was just one series. Um, so as far as Splintering is concerned, and you know things were redubbed, things were changed slightly here and there, but then, and the gap between Tatakai and the next series, we got Scramble City, two different Scramble Cities, and there was a manga on the side that did other stuff. So, splinters. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to stay on a thread here. You're going to have to like rail me, real, real, reel me in. Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm, let's. I'm gonna, for those of for those listeners and viewers who don't know, what is Scramble City in a nutshell? Scramble City is a bridge story to explain the change in tone, characters, and setting uh, between the 1984-1985 ish cast and series and the 1986 ish cast and series. So basically, it was the bridge for the Japanese audience between. Season two, where they're on Earth and Earth-based vehicles, and season three, which was us for us post movie. Now you've got Rodimus. Now you've got Ultra Magnus. You've got the Cybertronian modes. Optimus mm-hmm. ain't there no more. Um, mm-hmm. And and what- and, El- and it's largely set in space and the adventures involving Quintessons and Unicron and stuff going on out in the in the cosmos. There's, but without there's dwellers uh, that are in cos- depths. Yes, and Cosmos was there two episodes I think. anyway yeah so scramble city very much focused on the combiners that's where you get like the the idea of all the combiners sort of recombining with each other using the play pattern that the toys had that the american cartoon didn't mess around with that that japanese cartoon kind of took into full effect and when when did the japanese audience then get the 86 movie they got it in 1989 during the during the airing of Victory. I have a a, a copy of of a broadcast, and Cyborg 009 and a couple other series are on it. But it's mostly for me to capture Victory. And in the middle of the broadcast of all the commercials and stuff that are on there, they advertise, "Hey, go to go check out Transformers the movie. It's coming out now." But it's based on things that happened canonically. Twenty. Three math is hard, so victory set in twenty twenty five and the movie set in two thousand five, or whatever. So, twenty years. That's twenty in the past, which was our future, but it was nineteen eighty nine, so it was their future too. In an alternate timeline, math. Yeah, it's like an alternate timeline that led to the same timeline that season three was. Man, it's the clashing of universes. It's like a secret war, like a like a battle world of beyonder bullshit. Good stuff. <laughs> so, Peter, how did you discover all the Japanese series? You know, first off, uh, I now as a kid, 
as a kid, you hear rumors, you know, those, those, those like schoolyard rumors. So they kept coming out with Transformers after the cartoon ended. Fortress Maximus and Scorponok are introduced. The Golden Age of Cybertron is back. We need, you know, the, the 1987 toys, some of them, most of them. But then the toy line keeps going. And you hear kids on just, you know, we still buy Transformers. It was starting to fade. I was still into it. But, you know, they're like, you know, in another country, they're still making a cartoon. It's still awesome. And, and Optimus Prime's you know, doing this and doing that. And it's like... I don't believe you, but I want to believe you. And then years later, years later, you know, I'm still buying the toys. Da, 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 da. There's a glimmer in my head that maybe this is real. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then years later, I got an ATT in, in 95, 96, got online, found the, the news group and just started reading every thread I could because I need the information. I need to know as much as I can about whatever, whatever, whatever. And I discovered Scramble City, Headmasters, Master Force, Victory zone um and need to find how to get these need, did you did you know that blaster and soundwave had a fight to the death in the arctic did you know that and you see soundwave's head get blown off did you know that and like on the internet i'm just like there's no way this is real this is basically now i'm a teenager this is basically the teenage version of like edgelord kids online saying did you know did you know but no for real it, like it really it, that that sort of kind of happened and you can buy the tape from some jerk for two hundred dollars of just that episode he will sell it to you uh so don't fall for those don't fall for those scams uh but eventually i did source copies of everything at a, at a, at a reasonable rate for my my 1996 minimum wage budget and Anna, how about yourself? How did you first kind of discover the Japanese <laughs> cartoons? Uh, a little bit differently. I just kind of made the right friends who probably stumbled upon it a lot like Peter did. So I kind of disconnected and still had an interest after G1 ended, you know, got toys from, we were very poor. So I, I was getting toys from yard sales up through for years. You know, that was where I was mainly obtaining Vades when Vades ended up at the Dollar General we were able to afford like that's where that's why I love Action Masters so much because those things got clearance to hell to Dollar General and I was able to get some for that reason. So that's kind of how I stayed in. And I didn't really need the fiction at the time. Like I had the fiction from the commercials, which you know, a like 30 second commercial becomes this like vast fiction when you're a child or you're just adding to it somehow. So I was, you know, between that and toy bios, I just kind of filled up my own fiction. And um, didn't really know about the Japanese stuff in the middle. Didn't know about headmasters and all that until I started hanging out with nerds and basically middle school and high school. And I had friends who were, you know, 10 or so years older than me who had figured out the ancient world and the ancient Internet and were able to get some of this information. And they started showing me toys. They started showing me, you know, um, Japanese toys you know brought in like a star saber one day and was like hey check out the star saber and I was like what the hell is that it's a Gundam transformer and you know and I was very excited for the Gundam transformer I had to know where he was from so you know that group of friends helped me watch the series and you know when it was time for Beast Wars 2 and Neo I got to see some of it and see the toys and everything so they kind of helped me bridge the gap and from then on as soon as I got online which was just a little bit later um I was able you know basically I started my first job at 16 first day I paid for was the internet so I could start learning about Transformers and anime and stuff as a nerd um and then yeah I started getting into any stuff since then because I for a lot of times, it's a lot more fun for me. Um, and I think that's something you were asking. I said that you were kind of fishing for earlier is what's kind of like the difference of enjoying some of the Japanese media. And I'd say a lot of it is more, more relaxed and kind of, I don't know, optimistic and silly a lot of the times. Like, like you know, me and the book club, we just watched Super God Master Force. And Super God Master Force has a terrifying plot right like if you actually pay attention to what really happens to the earth in that story it is terrible but the whole time the characters are making silly jokes and pratfalls and kind of like 
you know, goofing around with each other. Because that's just always been the tone of the Japanese stuff. It's had more of that, like, we're going to have some comedy and humor and lightheartedness. I think lightheartedness goes in there. Where at the same time, you know, you look at the difference between Neo and Beast Wars Second, and you compare that to Beast Machines, right? Which was this, like, everything's really dark. We watched Batman Beyond and got excited. And we're going to make our, our own dark Transformers. And, you know, it's ridiculous, like, the difference between the tone, right? When you compare, like, Beast Machines to Car Robots, it's like, okay, these are two very different tones. So that's the big difference of being exposed to the Japanese media, and I think that's part of the reason I'm always asking for more lighthearted Transformers content and why I'm so into Earthspark. It's because, you know, the I get my more lighthearted content. Sorry, I know I, I answered no. more than you asked. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Thank you very much for that answer. I mean, it's just, it is it is just sort of interesting, you know, Peter, I'm just thinking, you being in a military family, being around kids that got exposure to mm. different parts of the globe, it, you know, do you think that had a, a factor in you finding out about that? Because you found out about it way earlier than I did. I, I, again, I don't know if, like, I was living in Florida when I actually found out, when I confirmed that these things existed. But the yeah. the schoolyard rumor mill thing, it might have been. Uh, we, we, had, we did a show a couple of years ago now where I got a big chunk of my collection used, you know, yard sale type, you know, it was, my mom worked with a lady and her son was getting out of Transformers. And so she sold my mom his entire collection and my mom gave it to me. And come to find out years down the road, that guy was in commercials in the Netherlands in the 80s. So and some of the toys that I got from him were toys that were used in the commercials. So there is that networking thing. And the kids, I don't remember who told me in 1988 that they're still doing Transformers overseas and Optimus Prime is a different guy now, but he's still Optimus Prime, but it's different. I don't know where I heard that, but I heard it. You know what I mean? So again, without confirmation, there's no telling if that was a kid whose family was stationed in Japan, a kid whose family was stationed in Hong Kong a little bit later or something, you know, like doing some something and saw the, the star TV dub or whatever. Um, I don't know. But until, you know, until I got that actual confirmation, there, there, there could have been any of that. But these connections, these yeah, things, and the reason I, they drift around. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up is because, like, my schoolyard conversations had nothing to do with that. Like, my schoolyard conversations, there was no inkling of Transformers being around. Like, Transformers, you know, and, and I don't know if it was like this for the two of you growing up, but, like, once you got to, like, fifth grade, you weren't allowed to like things in my school. Um, like, there was a set like a thing set like group of things you were allowed to this like is cool now this is and, not and so right exactly and so transformers was very very much not on that list so there was no one that was talking about transformers on the playground let alone that they're hey they're still making it in japan sort of thing um like that that's you know i grew up in a far south chicago suburb that was more cornfield and farming community than than you know uh kind of urban sort of feel at least at least when i first moved out there um so yeah we got i didn't have any of that sort of talk or discussion on the playground and and for me maybe stumbling on something in high school i don't even know maybe a toy fair covered something i met the toy fair the the wizard spinoff magazine maybe they showed a picture of star saber or something like I remember it was through Toy Fair that it was like, wait, what's this thing called Gundam? That's that's cool looking. What's that? Um, so, yeah, I had like very minimal exposure. And then in college, I don't know if it was maybe even through Napster that I was able to get some of the the, the um, subbed or dubbed episodes um, of Headmasters and watch some of that and was just like, OK, this is this is different. And, yeah, I remember seeing Soundwave and Blaster having the fight and like, oh no, it's okay. They came back and we made them different colors and gave them different names. They're they're different now, but 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 you know they're they look the same, but but they're different. And one's Billy now. Um, yeah. So it's like, wait, B Billy is that? Like, so there is that like silliness that's just like, especially as like a, a, you know a a late teen near adult 
where everything feels like it has to be serious. Like for a character to be called Billy was just like, what? Um, so that was really, really bizarre for me in terms of kind of stumbling upon that and just, you know, little by little over the years, like uncovering some of that stuff. Like, I mean, I remember, I don't think it was until Dreamwave was doing some of their big prints of like, hey, here's all the Optimuses that I found out like, oh, there was, there was, you know, um, Machine Wars and the Machine Wars toys. Like, I didn't, yeah. I didn't know what those were. So, yeah, it is just sort of funny, like, how we kind of stumble upon this. I mean, Anna, I was texting you the other day about, you know, there was a Hasbro website, I don't know if it was late 90s, early 2000s, where you could order Leo Convoy and Beast Wars Second Galvatron. I'm like, and Shadow Panther. This is awesome. Okay. It was, it was Panther, their first yeah. website, and, and they got a special sticker over the barcode so that you could, you know, you knew that you got it from but like, Hasbro Direct or whatever it was. I didn't trust it. I didn't order it. Like I had the money at the time. And I'm just like, cause I think, I think maybe it was like around when I had graduated high school or something. It's like, I don't, I don't think I can trust this. Cause like, it's still very much of like, you know, don't trust the internet. Don't buy things off the internet. You know, versus now we buy everything off the internet, but it was just, you know, um, yeah. So, so I, I still kick myself that I never got, and I still to this day don't have a, a Beast War second Galvatron. I you know, need to track that some of a good and down. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things that it was just like this, this trickle of, of like, what is this? You know, I'd say for probably the first half of the 2000s of, of like that information slowly trickling into my brain. So after, after G1 ended, you know, we had that first splinter with, with the 86 movie versus Scramble City in Japan. Then the G1 cartoon ended, and, and you know, Anna, you and Peter have both touched on this. What, what came after that? Like, the US G1 cartoon. After, yeah, after the US G1 cartoon ended, we had Headmasters, yeah. Master Force, Victory, and then the Zone OVA. Um. Each, each one was a full series with a full plot beginning to end. Each one, and talked about the stakes about uh, on Master Force. Each each one had like horrifying stakes for the planet Earth. The last three or four episodes of Headmasters, they erect these giant towers that transmit electricity all over the place and flood everything, and they try and I don't know raise Atlantis or something, and it's it it destroys the Earth just like just like. At the end of season one of Transformers, uh, the ultimate doom destroys the Earth, but then they just gloss over that and never mention it again. Like they bring Cybertron to Earth, it completely wrecks the planet, and then the next episode, Countdown to Extinction, they're like, "Oh, and then we fixed it. It's fine." Huffer used some cement on a dam, and everything was cool. There's a lot of there's a lot of destruction in this in this Transformers stuff. Uh, stakes are high, uh, and then yeah, Master Force the. Uh, from atop the Matterhorn, uh, Black Zarak used his double power to zap the planet, and he's going to kill everyone. Got to got to be zapping. And then uh, in victory, uh, Desiris wants to bring his city, his space city, to the planet Earth and blow away Star Saber forever due to sheer hatred in the cartoon, which I'll let Anna pick up from there. You mean the difference in the, the manga version? <laughs> so there were also Transformers manga coming out, and most of them did the where did the um where did the victory one come out? Was that a TV magazine thing or was that somewhere else that it came I out? I think it was TV magazine. Okay. Yeah. I most think of those it was first, TV magazine. Yeah. All all the way through the end of Battle Stars, I believe, was TV magazine. Okay, so the TV magazine mangas were, like, not long form, like, you know, weekly Shonen Jump style manga where it's, like, lots and lots of stuff, but you just have very few issues to tell a story. You know, the Victory and the Super God Master Force stories were both, like, you know, a handful of issues instead of this long, you know, 30 to 50 episode series. It was just a handful of issues. And <laughs> the story to Victory just was a lot more simple. And a lot more focused on how Star Saber and the source both adopted a human son and had dad fights. And eventually you find out that the Destrons are they're just trying to they're just trying to support their families, right? They're just trying to support their families back home. 
everybody shake hands and they get to get they get along and everything's fine in the end and it's just such a more like that was just so fun we read that with book club um like six months ago and it was just so fun that like goofy light-hearted take on victory especially introducing um june and so on to the story yeah. which you know june's in the cartoon but so on is not and <laughs> having saber and the stories have freaking dad fights who could be the better robot dad this is such a i don't know it's precious like those kind of like things like that are just like some of my favorite transformers moments and a lot of our friends, you know, in, in the cast just, like, don't really know much about the Japanese continuity. So I enjoy when we get to talk about this because it, it's stuff that I find really just the most amusing. Everyone loves the dino babies and, and Lysak and Esmeral and, and, like, the whole the whole other part of the gang that cartoon-only fans never meet, know nothing about. It's a It's a... It's a like Phil mentioned earlier, a tonal shift between Beast Wars and Beast Wars Neo and Beast Wars you No know, second. I'm I'm out of order, but you know what I mean. And and Beast Machines, everything just being like tonal whiplash in terms of grim dark versus happy happy. And yeah, the 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 manga are completely different tellings of the same characters' adventures. It's 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 something. It's it's fun. It's short. It's fun. It's like. Should you really take that manga as canon over the show? Probably not, but... I love the idea of Desiris being a dad who will do anything, anything to protect his kids. I like to pretend that in the anime, all that stuff is still happening just off camera. Like in terms of, you know, his family and, and the Destron families, he, he was charged with protecting the civilians on the fortress... And then Star Saber just came out of nowhere and sent it into the Dark Nebula. And he's like, what the hell, dude? Wait, you know those were the civilians on there. We don't do that. Now you're going to pay. And he will go to the ends of the Earth or the ends of the galaxy or the ends of the universe, however you want to phrase it, to avenge his family and his friends' his families. That's good stuff. It's good stuff. I like that combination. It's I mean, a little dark, but I like the combination of things. The best villains are mm-hmm. sympathetic villains. And Desiris in the cartoon is out of his mind just power hungry. If you add that sympathy to him, that 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 you know reason for doing it other than I really hate Star Saber, then it 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 adds so much more depth. And it, I know it's head canon, but it's head canon based in actual canon. But it's head canon that also follows logically, because if we go back to Super Gun Master Force. Right in Super God Master Force, which came right before Victory, the main, you know, in the big thing about Super God Master Force that turns off a lot of fans is that it really does focus on the human bodied characters doing human stuff and then basically putting on their mech suit transformers and having fights, right? Which is fantastic. It makes a very fun, amusing anime. But I understand why a lot of Transformers fans are like, ew, humans don't like it as much. But anyway. Mega and Giga are our main villains through most of the series, and they are building a family, the right? They're this to... like weird robot, robot driving couple that, like, according to the manga, are like resurrected ancient people in the anime. They never bother really saying that, they're just kind of there somehow. But they are literally taking the Headmaster Junior's in as their, like, wayward children and building a family. There's that same kind of, like, the bad guys are building a family idea behind that series as well. Which just, it made them a lot more, like, you're sad when things don't work out for them. Like, they're doing terrible stuff all the time. But they have that, like, human moment of regret sometimes. They have that need to make a family. You know, they, they see that um, Cancer is having trouble. They give him a little friend. They give him brownie to hang out with. They give him a talking god, which they is definitely what you should give to your youngest son. Yep. Are we sure this wasn't an American cartoon and not a Japanese cartoon? If you, <laughs> when you watch Master Force, just of note, uh, when I got online in ATT back in the 90s or whatever, there were rumors that, that Headmasters had been fully dubbed by the Gen 1 US cast 
and was going to be released. But then at the last second, there was a warehouse fire and all of it was destroyed, lost forever. And Hasbro decided to pull the plug on the cartoon altogether. They put together the rebirth in five minutes and they were like, okay, this is what you get instead. Rumor, of course. No, no basis in fact. But when you watch Master Force, newspaper clippings, uh, things shown on TV in the show are in English. It doesn't say Destrons in a lot of stuff. It says Decepticons, like in the original anime. So were they possibly opting or angling for the, you know, the chance that it could be localized and sent out to the UK, Hong Kong, uh, the US, wherever? Who knows? We don't know. But it didn't happen uh, until later with the, the Malaysian dub or whatever it was. So... What was the question? How much later was the Omni Dub? The the notorious Omni Dub yeah, yeah. that makes a mess uh, out of everything. I think it was ninety ninety one. Okay, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So a few years later, because the Omni Dub for Headmasters, like you know, Phil was joking about Blaster being Billy and you know Blur being Wally and Spike being Sparkle and you know all the silly names. They really made a mess out of that plot for Headmasters. Like, mm-hmm. the Headmasters plot is completely, like, bizarre after they did the dub. The dub for Super God Master Force is, it still follows the same plot. It's kind of hard to listen to sometimes because some of the, the voice cast definitely has variations in quality. And I've heard that the conditions that they recorded all that under were terrible and they weren't getting paid enough and all sorts of bad things around it. However, you know, it exists and it mostly follows the plot. It uses the American toy names for the people, which is really uncomfortable because they're clearly Transformers names, but then there's humans having them, you know, like Jen Riot being literally called Optimus Prime, like just being a dude who's named Optimus yeah. Prime for some reason. Some Rob Japanese teenager. Quote, yeah. Rob likes to quote the thing where he's like, my name's Optimus Prime. I'm Japanese or whatever it is. And it's just the worst it's terrible it is it is there's some terrible stuff to that like they don't mess up the plot as much but it is really hard to listen to because i had this idea when we were doing it for book club i was like i'm gonna listen to the omni dub instead of the actual subs because i'm gonna be cool and edgy and listen to the omni dub because i've i've read the subs multiple times and then i made it like i made it nine episodes and then i was like Gosh, I can't handle this anymore. I have to go to the subs because it's just I want to be able to read the logical version of everything. Uh, I can't stand them referring to Minerva's might be. I think it's kind of funny how much of the Japanese stuff like has stuck with the fandom. Because like to me, it's not Jin Rai, it's Power Master Optimus Prime, and it's High Q is is his power master partner and that's what it was in you know in the toys and in the comics here in the u.s and so that is not totally scrubbed away because we did i think he still was called high q in in the um uh uh titans return toy but it it definitely feels like people overlook that so much more in hold true to the, the Japanese stuff so much better. You know, it, I mean, for, for the, the new box set, is it called Squeeze Play or Cancer for, for that Headmaster Jr.? I don't think they're going to call it. I, I think it's Squeeze Play confirmed, but it looks okay. like Cancer because they, they had different model sheets. If you look, look at the, yeah. the model sheet for the Marvel Comics Squeeze Play versus Cancer from, from Master Force, it's two different. The way the beast mode is, like, standing is different. Um, well, and, and then he comes with brownie, right. a robot-sized well brownie, the, which the never existed because brownie was actually human size. But or yep. he was yeah. he, he was actual gun size. He was a yeah. big enough gun he for was... a how old is Cancer? Nine, eight. He's a really little kid. Run around with his gun. He's his best friend. <laughs> so good. So now we need to have the head cannon that that the kid who is Cancer is the child from. The the Japanese toy catalog that's holding the gun robots um, <laughs> in the Nazi uniform. Oh God! Oh God! Yeah, that's that's a thing that exists. 
Yeah. But the cancer I mean, himself. I keep trying to like find that picture when like when like when I have people when I have friends or like I'm in like other like toy groups that are not as transformer centric. When they bring up like the craziness of the Japanese Transformers, it's like, no, no, this is a thing, and I, I can never find that picture. This has been like two or three times, and even one like within the last two weeks, where it was like, let me try and see if I can find that picture of like the the kid in the Nazi uniform with the the Japanese toy transforming gun. It's Ralph. Um, but I was gonna say, I, I don't you know mentioned... why I want to find it. I just find it amusing. You mentioned that Genrys kind of stuck around. I think Genrys is kind of an important character. Because all of G1 took place in the States, right? So for Japanese viewers, they didn't really have a Japanese character, you know, other than the series being redubbed in Japanese. But then Jinrai was canonically, you know, he was a, an immigrant from Japan who came to the States to be a truck driver. Mm-hmm. Somehow, like, that was his American dream was to become a truck driver. And, you know, he was really the first Japanese main character in the cast, him and Shuda ended up being the uh, the Japanese guys in the cast. So I think that character means a lot, you know, because it kind of brought Optimus Prime. It kind of brought Optimus Prime over the ocean, right? It brought him to Japan as a as a Japanese guy getting to be Optimus Prime. You know, he got to be that body and wear the Optimus Prime suit and still be Jinrai. So I think that's why he's kind of stuck around because he's kind of a cool character to kind of bridge. The two. Yeah. Meanwhile, Haikyuu just feels somewhat like a Professor Extrapoff. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe just bald white guy. It, it, it just, you know, they all look the same to me. Um, yeah, it, it is just kind of funny. Like you, you mentioned that how much that kind of stuff is stuck around with, with you know, the stuff that hasn't. But so we, we got multiple... Japanese TV shows that had a combination of toys that did get released here in the U.S., toys that got released here in the U.S. with different paint jobs, um, and as well as toys that only got released in Japan. And you know, now some of these toys that only got released in Japan—I mean, they're they're the Haslabs we're getting now. You know, Desaurus, you know, that we've talked about, Star Saber that we just talked about. I mean, even the the most recent Transformers Haslab is the car robots, you know, Optimus and, and Ultra Magnus. Uh-huh. I mean, granted, yeah, they came out in the robots in disguise, but that was a Japanese design first that that we just kind of imported it. Um, so it is it is sort of interesting that we got, you know, w- all of this stuff is so important to the fandom. And then what we got was with Transformers Armada, there was this sort of big trumpeting and going back to the idea of Toy Fair, like that was that was like how I would get toy news back in the day. There was no there were no Facebook groups, you know, that were were leaking this stuff. But like Toy Fair having the article about Takara and Hasbro working together to make this new thing called Transformers Armada, and now we're going to kind of merge this into to one thing. And you know, granted, we've still gotten you know we, after Armada, we still got like the Kiss Player stuff. We got Transformers Cloud. We got the the Legends comics, um, but but the brand became much more homogenized, and I feel like we lost some of that. I, I don't know Japanese kind of I, I don't know flavor to some of this. Um, so I don't know, Peter. You're shaking your head. You got a different take. No, I don't thought. have a different take. A different thought. But you got to slow down and go back and forward at the same time. You got to take it step by step. We talked earlier. We started the show talking about RID and how it felt rushed and crappy and lame compared to the yeah. source material car robot which was fun but still different still tonally along the lines of beast wars second beast wars neo and clearly designs from the same team as far as the robots and some of the toys were transmetal twos that had been coming out concurrently in the u.s in 1999 so yeah very cool stuff after beast machines wrapped the next line was supposed to come out in the u.s Mainframe animated. Trans tech. Mainframe animated. Same like gang making it as Beast Machines ish. And they were going to do this thing called Trans Tech. Trans Tech got scrapped. We're not going to go that direction because people are drooling over all this stuff that's going on in Japan. How about as a stopgap, we just dub the thing that just came out over there? We'll dub Car Robot. We'll throw it out. We'll put it on Fox Kids because we already got the time slot. We'll just plug in this new Transformers thing. It'll be fine. Everyone will like it. 
We don't have to, it'll be just like 1984 again. We don't have to spend any money on engineering the toys. We don't have to spend any money on media. We don't have to spend anything other than the dub. We just bring it all over, push it all out. We rake in that sweet, sweet cash. And while they're buying up all this stuff, we're going to work hand in hand with Takara this time. This is Aaron Archer. We're going to work hand in hand with Takara to come up with a theme, a cartoon, a unified front in terms of like toys, comics, cartoons, both U.S. and Japan. So the people in the U.S. can be like, Japan gets all the cool stuff. You know, that way everyone gets the same thing. We're going to do a brand unification before we called it a brand unification, but they might have called it a brand unification somewhere. Someone in the chat and someone in the comments is going to be like, I saw a post on AT. I saw a post on Big Bot where they called it brand unification and Peter's wrong. I don't care. I'm right. So anyway, none of you remember Big Bot. Who remembers Big Bot? Comment below if you remember Big Bot, one of the first fan websites that like didn't stick around for reasons. What was I talking about? Brand unification. So we yeah, Transformers. Yeah. Um, Armada. Armada came out. Armada came out in what? 2002? September 2002? Something like that. Yeah. Dreamwave pushed out the comics at the same time. Packages were done by Dreamwave-ish. There were, there were things that were happening all at once, and it was happening really fast. And this happened concurrently with a new Gen 1 comic that was coming out in the States by superstar Pat Lee and uh, the gang from Dreamwave. Uh, and then we had a homo- uh, an homogenized version of Transformers Media on both sides of the pond, plus uh, over in Europe. But there were things in Europe that were different. And there were things in Japan that were different from what we were getting on all spectrums. And we can get into that, too. That might be a whole show in and of itself. Panini magazines and comics versus the the, the DVD linkage comics versus, I mean, do you guys want to play? We could play. Let's, let's maybe save that for another episode. Let's, let's stick to the broad strokes. Broad strokes, okay. We're still at Armada. Armada. Yeah. Armada. Someone, someone, someone take it. Here's the baton. So, again, we got other media, but, but the cartoons from that point on were one cartoon, and, and, and it is sort of, you know, I don't know. Do, do you guys feel like the brand lost something at that point in time? Kinda. Like, it's lost a lot more lately because things kind of came back. You know, Japan kept doing its own thing after the Unicron trilogy, right? Things started to kind of go back to more like, we're going to do players and crap. And like, you know, weird stuff started coming out of Japan again. The world was happier. Um, But I think we kind of lost that a little more recently. So I think things did kind of come back because Armada was a, Armada was not exactly what we asked for. Because, you know, we were watching the, the 2 Beast Wars series and getting cooler and more complex, very Japanese Transformers. And then we saw car robots, cooler, more complex, very Japanese Transformers mixed with some of our favorites from Beast Wars. It was a cool thing. And then they were like, okay, we're going to unify and we're going to come up with something that is more kid friendly and more play pattern focused. Now, this is not exactly... This is not the original Armada Megatron for anyone who can tell the difference. This is obviously the new legacy one. But, but when I got the Armada toys as a collector who was progressing into my teens at that that point, and I was wanting the grown up cool action figures, it wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for the next Super Fire Convoy. And what I got was actually a really good, well-made toy with cool play patterns and mini cons and features that didn't really appeal to my edgy teenager bullshit, right? My edgy teenager bullshit didn't want that. So I was a little disappointed and I was really one of my Japanese stuff. Good thing an alternate. Anyway. Um, but yeah, it just kind of... Well, yeah, because it felt like those those toys felt like toys yeah. versus what we were getting from car robots, you know, robots in the skies, beast machines, those like, like beast machines, rat trap is an awesome toy. 
I, I, I don't know. Someone wants to fight me on that. You're no, welcome he's to great. Like, that's a cool. He catches thing. a bad rap because of the character's evolution or whatever in the cartoon. You know, I think a lot of yeah. that animus is 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 imprinted on the toy, which is a fun toy, fun play pattern, yeah, fun features. You know, the go wield mode, and his tail does whatever. You know, it, it it's a cool toy. Great molds. There, there were some real duds in Beast Machines, but there were some real winners, and Rat Trap's one of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we won't talk about Silver Bolt. Um, I love that but, toy. It's so you stupid. Know, yeah, but but you know, even like even the non-cartoon character Beast Machines toys, there were some great figures that came out of that line and, and it just felt like the complexity and and all of that just faded so much once it, we got to our it didn't fade um, it didn't fade it stopped like yeah. it was just a full abrupt like you hit the brick wall and here are the blocks here are the bricks yeah. here are the minicons fun play pattern as has been stated fun play pattern high quality toys great plastic great engineering for what they are the thought was there uh, however and we've the fandom has argued about armada for 23 years now and will continue to argue about it forever the redos like anna held up the uh, the recent armada legacy megatron fantastic toy fantastic toy the original armada megatron i got that for my birthday in 2003 i want to say 2003 that sounds right and big fun love the toy but he is a brick. His arms do this, and that's about it. Cool trap thing, cool flip out flappy thing, cool cannony plow plow thing, cool knife hand. He's got a shank. That's cool. Yeah. But his face looks weird. He can only do one pose. His legs do nothing, you know, and, and that's it. But I enjoyed him for what he was, knowing full well that the engineering could be way better because we just saw it for the last four years, right over there on the other shelves next door. It felt like a downgrade. But it'll get better. And it did because we moved on to Energon, which was toy wise much better. We've got ball joints are working again. We've got ratcheting stuff like heavy articulation that that energon mirage is a miracle so cool compared to just about any armada figure and they still maintained a play pattern it wasn't the armada play pattern it's the energon play pattern you've got the little energon weapons that can do whatever they do and you've got the little energon bloops that can plug into people and give them magic sparkles or whatever and then there was the cartoon and it should be noted before we talk about the Energon cartoon that the Armada cartoon was pushed out in the States before it was fully animated or fully ha having scripts fully realized. And it, it was supposed to be like a, a, a Japanese Transformers cartoon that aired in America, but it aired in America before it was done and didn't air in Japan until six months after it aired in America when it was a little bit more done, but still not great. So there are even animation differences between the, the localized versions Minicons that appear and disappear. Names are pretty consistent in the Japanese version, whereas in the States, they were just calling anyone whatever, whenever they felt like it, changing names willy-nilly uh, across, across ep from episode to episode, or sometimes even within the same scene. Things didn't have to make sense. And we just kind of ran with it, because what else did we have? There, were no, there was no other Transformers cartoon out at that point. Now we're lucky. We've got two or three at once, or we did a couple of years ago, you know? Uh, and, and we can get there again. Mm, we got a movie coming. We got all sorts of media and stuff. Now we're spoiled. We're spoiled. But back then we weren't spoiled, but we felt spoiled because they were paying attention to us. There's a comic. There's another comic. There's a cartoon. There's a toy line. Could be better, but it's still fun. And we know new things are coming because like with Toy Fair and with message boards and with websites starting to proliferate in terms of like quality of the, the, the information and quality of the presentation because old photos on websites from 1998 and 1999 were pretty abominable. Things are getting better. It's 2002, you guys. Things aren't great because it's 2002 and 2001 was last year and we had a rough time. But, you know, it's getting better-ish. Ish. Energon. The cartoon, the cartoon for Armada was such... 
It was such a disappointment, though, like, coming off of Car Robots and being, like, just looking at the animation. I just remember, you know, here I was, you know, about to go into college. I was, like, definitely edgy teenager years. Or was I in college? No, I was about to go into college. And I just started watching, and I was like, wait a second. I'm watching all this anime at this point, right? Like, I am torrenting so much anime right as it comes out, watching fan subs. And then I'm watching you, this you animation. You were legally just... buying... You were legally buying everything that you watched. Yes, you know. yes. I was, I was buying the Japanese versions and then getting the fans. So I was making sure that I had the originals first, just like all the ROMs and emulators back then, you know, never, ever having it without having the originals. So as I have my original DVDs from our DVDs, <laughs> my original VHSs from Japan, um, I was able to get those. And, you know, after watching all that and then watching Armada, it was like the animation was wrong. Like, watching so much anime, it was clearly like, okay, there's something wrong with this animation. Like Peter said, it wasn't done. And it wasn't, even when it was done, it wasn't done as well as other anime from that period was. So it just really stood out. It was like, oh, man, this isn't that good. And the toy line's kind of not what I wanted. So it actually caused me to walk away from Transformers for a little bit, you know, combined with how poor I was in college. Uh, to just be like, okay, I'm just going to buy a few toys every now and then now. Just like the really cool ones, like the aforementioned Energy on Mirage, right? Like definitely use my money to get that thing because it looked so neat. And it was back to my like, you know, car robots and Beast Wars style. Like this is the cool toy that I wanted um, type of deal. But it, it, it was just kind of a bummer because it was like, here we have this brand new division, this collaboration, and it just did not come out to be what we wanted. No, it, it, it didn't, and, you know, over the years, you know, the, the brand continued to be, you know, pretty much developed here in the U.S. Like, Hasbro really took the reins at that point and said, this is what the brand's going to be, and we got, we got different versions of the Ooh. brand because we got, you know, all right, after the Unicron trilogy ended, then we got you know, the, the Bayverse movies. And then we got the, the Transformers animated show, which is fantastic. Um, and very different tones, very different feels, very different types of designs with those. So it, we, we haven't been lacking necessarily in terms of Transformers media, but, but I think there's just, just something to be said about where those designs and where those... Um, inspirations are coming from and i think it really was neat to have something <laughs> brought to the table that was originated in japan mainly targeting a japanese audience versus now everything's you know either targeting an american audience or targeting a, a global homogenized audience um and i think we've lost some of the i don't know just just magic yeah, just there's some there's some spark, no pun intended, that is that is missing from the line to a certain extent. I think like after after the um, Unicron trilogy, we kind of went into this like treasure hunt period where if you knew to go look for the Japanese stuff, you saw, you found some really unique, weird, and fun stuff like Kiss Players, right? You find Kiss Players, you find Vinyl Tech, you find the Vinyl Tech story, which is hard to follow, but it's there. Uh, um, you find Robot Masters, right? You're finding all these series that you know your your friends who are only watching the American media don't know about, but you're you're hunting down the Japanese media, and it's cool and interesting and different. And you're getting these like really cool paint jobs that Takara was doing for things. Like you know, I know a lot of people question how much I enjoy his players and the media from it, but the the toys, like the decos on those three vinyl tech figures they put out for kids players are just fantastic and so much better than their alternator equivalents not like the alternator equivalents were bad in any way it's just these were like fancy high-end figures that like if you knew to look for them they were out there they were really cool so i think we had that that kind of long period of being able to find those like japanese treasures that were happening at the same time as our american toy lines it felt like a bonus. It felt like if you were in the know and you were on the websites and you were keeping track of what was coming out on all ends of the spectrum, you could find 
really cool stuff. And like, you're still doing the American stuff if you want, la la la. Your friends are doing the American stuff if they want, la la la, whatever. But I'm over here and it is the same stuff, but cooler. And, 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 and that was the, the feel for years. Like Anna said, the, 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 you knew you had the, you had the, you had the, the key to the cool bathroom, the executive bathroom and, uh, go up there. It's cool. Well, you, you weren't the filthy casual just buying something off a shelf from Toys R Us. You know, I was. You were the person who was in the know. Well, yeah, you we were because we were we were buying all yeah. of it. Um, or, or you know, Peter, you were buying all of it. I was buying. I, don't know, I, I was I was Enough. pushing for which was my favorite version of of the figure. Um, you know, especially once the time by the time we got to titan's return it was definitely like all right let's wait for the takara version to see what that looks like versus selling for the american version which might not be as good and then and then we had trip to and then that all ended. but we have there's, um, a, there's a big section in there because you've got all the movie stuff you've got prime you've got animated not in that order animated then prime and then you've got go which was a a, a different spin-off of prime rather than beast hunters you know and and japan had their own stuff going on. They had their own stuff going on for animated. They had their own stuff going on for all of the movies, including exclusives, different decos, different types of releases mm-hmm. for things that we got in the States, um, omissions to the things that we got in the States. Uh, I like to, I like to, and, and animated had like crazy decos, crazy decos, beautiful decos on their stuff. Yeah. Um, I love animated. I love animated toys. I love the animated cartoon. Um, one thing I want to, Real quick, go back to uh, when we talk about tonal shifts and and comedy in Transformers, the original Beast Wars dub and the Metals dub were not word for word like translations. They added ridiculous amounts of humor and wordplay and just like noises, vocal tics, things that weren't in the U.S. version to make it less weighty. I mean, the, the plot is the same, essentially. It's just, the episodes are just dubbed episodes, but they added vocal audio zaniness to the tracks. And that's in the dubs of all the U.S. Beastie type stuff. So there was that tone maintained in Japan to a really ridiculous degree. Um, yeah. Yeah, and it's just, you know, again, I feel like the brand has become more and more homogenized. It, it is fun to see that we are getting the current Skybound book, the Transformers Earth Spark cartoon, what we got last year for, for Rise of the Beast, what we're getting for Transformers 1, you know, what, what the designs were for Transformers Reactivate, if that video game ever comes to fruition, probably not. But the designs were different. The designs were neat. And then we're getting the legacy toy line. We're getting the studio series toy line. So we are getting a lot of Transformers and we're getting new designs, but it's just, there was, and I, I think for me, what like hit me on the head with this last week when I was thinking about it, like, are we ever going to see a design that's so outside of the box like Magmatron was again? Like, I don't, I don't know if we'll ever see something like that again, you know? I guess you could argue maybe some of the Baver stuff was kind of you know crazy in its own right. It was. Um, That's fair. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 yeah. That that is fair. But it's just I don't know. You know, when you look at Desaurus and the kind of the play pattern, when you look at Magmatron and the play pattern, it just was part of it's a, a thing. Of, even even Fire Convoy, um, and, and his play pattern is is so fantastic and it's so Japanese, and I just kind of. I, I wish we were getting a little bit more of that in this day and age versus very good toys, very nicely made toys, but things that just feel like there is not as much originality. A lot of that comes down to how the ownership of the brand and how the stewardship of the brand was handled in the nineties. You know, Hasbro owns transformers but Takara makes transformers, you know? So there's like this, there's this like partnership and whatever. So in the nineties, when, when Hasbro was just, we're doing G2, we've got some designers in Britain that are doing 
they did their own thing for five minutes. So we're just going to release part of that as G2 or Machine Wars or whatever. We don't care. Oh, Beast Wars. Yeah, we'll do that. Beast Wars stories are great. The people at Kenner did their thing. Good job, guys. Big, you, you resurrected a, a dead brand in the country, you know? But the Japanese folks were allowed to just play. And they were, I mean, they were coming off of the Brave stuff. They were doing concurrent Brave and Transformers stuff. And they were experimenting with, with how transformation works. The Beast, uh, Beast Wars Neo is nothing but, not nothing but, that's unfair to say. It is a line focused on what can we do with shell forming? How can we put someone in a shell and make them, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a bunch of fiddly arms and legs crammed into a whatever. Um, Beast Wars second pulled a lot of the Beast Wars molds over and then they made like three or four of their own thing and retooled some stuff. Um, but there were, there were experiments and risks taken uh, with the way they handled things. And I think that culminated in the awesomeness that is the RID set of original molds. RID car robot, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, where you have, you've got some shell formers, you've got some fiddly, foldy funkiness. You've got some Gen 1 love because we don't want to, you know, omit uh, 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 Baldigus. And it was just a good mesh of things. They were given a, a chance to play in their own sandbox. And then Hasbro saw how successful that was in the eyes of American fans. I don't want to say they got greedy or jealous, but they just wanted some of that without having to hear online over and over again. If, if a representative went online in, the, in those early Halcyon days of interneting, like everything better in Japan. Japan more gooder than America. America just make Beast Wars that bad. Me no like. Me like car robot or whatever. Um, and they wanted a piece of that action. So they worked with Takara. They did their thing. Armada, Energon, Cybertron. It got better year after year. And then the movies happened. And, you know, whatever happened there. Animated was a single cartoon. Local localization issue uh, differences, whatever. Uh, Prime had the Go spinoff over there and the Beast Hunter spinoff over here, but there were some shared toys between that stuff. And then we come to the Prime Wars trilogy. And the Prime Wars trilogy was handled... Well, well hold on. I did forget about... Um, they had the two combiners of three where it was the fire truck, the police car, and um, oh my god, they were were they Japanese or like like Chinese focused for those? That, that's that's um, go. Okay, so go. Oh. Yeah, okay, that's go. You're right. You're right. Right. Let's go. Yeah. My bad. No. Where we have good. the dragon train Optimus. The Prime. dragon train Optimus Prime. Exactly. And everyone combined, yeah. and they and they were chasing after stone discs or something. The beast dragon discs. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and that had its own. Was that also the line that had the beast hunters repaints? Yeah. Uh, retools. Okay. Okay. Retools. Yes. Yes. Because they got new heads and, and and a lot of new stuff. And and that that also again that focus that to me seemed like you know we got some of that Japanese influence, but there was also like it, it, it felt like to me like hey we're gonna try and or something that maybe the Chinese market will like a little bit more as well. That was that was opening up, and that was right around the time that uh, what movie was it? Age of Extinction, where they really pandered to uh, Chinese audiences by, ha- by yeah. having the last last act of the movie happen in Hong Kong, I believe. Was it Hong Kong? Right. I don't but, remember. But filmed in Chicago, so it's like, hey, wait, that's the Sears Tower back shh, there. Shh, shh. We're in, we're we're yeah. over there now. Um, Wait, isn't that McCormick place? No, no, you've never been to Chicago, man who described okay. himself as being spending his early days in the south side of Chicago. It was a farmland. You said so. You're grounded. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I didn't spend my early days in the south side of Chicago. No, south suburb. No, 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 no. There's, there's a significant difference. I see no difference. You're good. Chicago is just a little town. I had one black kid in my in my junior high. There was a significant difference. Okay. Lack of diversity is what he's getting at. Oh, yeah, yeah. Significant lack of diversity. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah. Legends. The Prime Wars trilogy starts. 
and we get Titans Return. I'm sorry, Combiner Wars, which is a massive success, and everyone loves it in its fancy pants. Combiner Wars is released in Japan a little bit later as... Unite Warriors. Unite Warriors, yep, as, as like mm -hmm. box sets or whatever. And in the meantime, the 2014 line is released... Well, the 2010 line was released as United, and then we had Generations, which was kind of a... It wasn't a unification, but it used some of the same packaging and some deco differences. But then Legends started, and Legends starts with a reissue of Optimus Primal or Beast Convoy, uh, some of the 2014 stuff, the Thrilling 30 items, uh, Rat Trap, Rhinox. Well, not eventually. They, they came out eventually as EXs. But Legends was like this... It, it was like a redeco pile it felt almost university to me at that point like yeah. early on early on it felt like yeah. the american universe was in 2003 where it's just redecos why am I, this this line kind of stinks yeah because we got animated black arachnia redone as beast wars black arachnia which was interesting and each figure came with what an amazing God. piece of fiction that we couldn't read unless you were someone who could read Japanese. Correct. And it takes place in the Generation 1 cartoon continuity spinning out of the episode The Face of the Nijika where the Zemojins use their forehead crystals to do whatever and they create the Legends world which is a, a, a world outside of the G1 world where all these characters from all these disparate universes can, it's like a dream world kind of, where they can fight and have wacky adventures and some characters exist only as dolls there and some characters exist as TV shows. I don't know. I don't know all the details. I don't know. It, it's a lot. It gets wacky. And but it's like so cool because suddenly we have Japanese Transformers fiction again. And like some of it is very serious, like normal, like you know, Transformers being heroes, having hero battles, whatever. And then some of it is literally like Megatron starting an evil toy company where he gets to live out his office ladies fetish by making women Transformers dress up as office ladies. Like it's weird right there's a halloween scene where everyone's wearing halloween costumes there's all sorts of very bizarre goofy stuff in there the packing comic for the um, megatronia repaint of victorian is some of the most bizarre transformers fiction because like one of the members of megatronia has a has a little thing she likes to do where she cuts off the combiner pegs from guy transformers and then takes the energy from them. It, there's some weird stuff that happens in the Legends comic. And it goes back to very manga, very like zany Japanese storytelling. And it's like a part of the fiction that I had been missing for years as we didn't really have anything like that. And it was so fun to get those translations. And because, you know, people were translating them online and posting them. And I've collected as many of the comics as I can. Um, not, can't read those versions, but I can read the translations. And, and um, all yeah, the translations they're, they're are fun. available online. You can they are. find where can you find them? You know, I'm not sure. I have to look for them every time. Okay. They're Honestly. out there. They're out there. <laughs> they're out there. They yeah. are out there. They're not terribly hard to find. They're a little, little complicated to find sometimes, but they're not terribly hard to find. But like, it's just like really weird. Like Peter said, like explaining the story is something that will make you kind of like, you know, break out in a sweat and get tired from doing because it's really kind of like this complex wackiness. But I think like sometimes people explain that can, that complex wackiness is a bad thing, but it's fun is what it is. Like, it's just kind of, again, it's more lighthearted goofiness that is just fun and silly and combines it's a big mashup story sticking everybody together if you if you're like me and you're excited to see the um the the kiss players robots 
um, get to reunite with the Kiss players, humans, and they get to have like interactions and stuff. It's just, it's a lot of damn fan service, honestly, and not like the the gross anime fan service that's all about, um, it's all about showing off body parts, but yeah, no, this is like the fan service where it's like your favorite characters are all together you get to see what this different person does with that person optimus primal and megatron are gonna have a conversation but not that megatron the gray one and it's just you know it's fun and yeah i loved it i was so excited to see it like it's got a it's got a like cute fun art style and does it add anything to your usg1 continuity other than confusion not really but does it add to the japanese g1 continuity absolutely (laughs) I think it, I think it, and it depends on where we talked earlier about headcanon, personal headcanon, you know, uh, I think for the parts that you like, you can absorb it into your headcanon and it does fill in some gaps between episodes in G1. Uh, it, it certainly does. As far as continuity goes, there's a slidey scale with the way the Japanese stuff all fits together. It's apparently all on the same timeline or whatever. Like the G1 stuff and Car Robot are the same timeline along with the Battle of the Stargate stuff. And it's so not working. It doesn't, you know, and Vinyl Tech tried to fix it a little bit and then Vinyl Tech had some stops and starts and ultimately didn't fix it. And Legends doesn't try to fix it, but it has fun with it. And and um, Kiss players did the same thing. Tried to it did. weave in and out like the 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 radio dramas and 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 the associated media. Tried to weave in and out of the the car robot G one and various other series to make it all kind of fit. How did how did Maximus the ship battleship Bruce? If you watch the Omni dub, uh, how did battleship Bruce end up on Planet Master back before? Uh, Fortress knew to build the battleship Bruce and things like that. I'm saying Bruce for for our listeners. I'm saying it tongue in cheek because that's not what they call it. Um, but part two of Kiss Players. This is part two of Kiss Players. Part one of Kiss Players right. is this weird. I, I've is always the, thought of it as an Evangelion parody. Like it is very much like a parody story that's like you know risque for the sake of being goofy risque. And everybody took it a little too seriously and took it as like this big offensive thing when really I think it was honestly a parody. The second season was the the girl characters from Kiss Players going on a time traveling adventure with some random cassettes and spark box and they got to see all these different events. It kind of reminds me of um <laughs> the really stupid comparison, but there was that old also an anime um translated to English. So there was this old religious cartoon called Superbook. Where they would the super get this book magic Bible. House. Yeah, Superbook yeah. and Flying House. They would travel I, through different Bible stories. That's that's what the season two of his players was. It was Transformers Superbook and Flying House. I was I was forced to watch that stuff as a kid. I, I'm I am familiar. There are I there are robots. It because I like the animation, right? Like yep, I was like, yep. oh, this is cool animation. I wonder why. This reminds me of Voltron. And then you, <laughs> I was like, and then oh, you find out why when okay. I was an adult. Yep. And there are robots in those in those series so for some reason robots explored the bible you know but anyway we're not yeah. advertising that we're advertising season two of kiss players which was fun it was just in this weird manga format a little bit of radio dramas here and there but you know all those radio dramas have been recently recently translated they are available on youtube and they are odd <laughs> fun fun odd weirdness but it's just that like I think one of the things to add here is how mixed media the Japanese um, storytelling for Transformers has been. Because, yeah, it's been anime. It's been manga and TV magazine. It's been radio dramas. It's been pack-in comics. And not pack-in comics that just tell a, like, weird little random story. But pack-in comics that tell a long, winding story across many, many toys that are serialized and need to be read in order, right? Like, this is diverse modes of storytelling. It's very interesting to me. Story pages, too. The very end of G1, Mm -hmm. uh, Operation Combination and and Battle Stars were not, they weren't manga per se. They were advertisements for the toys that told a brief story, like, 
you better buy these toys because this is what's happening in Transformers world, but you're not going to see any more media based on it. So have fun. It's like, okay. Final text story. Was that told on the website? Is that how you get the Biden text story? So you know it was text. I'm trying to remember recall. how that was originally distributed. Hmm. Yeah. they're creative with the way they distribute story and i think i've always enjoyed that as a fan like that's one of the things that draws me to it because there there is some manga there is some story there's freaking radio dramas right like that's so that's so like 1940s <laughs> it's fun um but yeah it's a very diverse way of storytelling and unfortunately we haven't really gotten a whole lot of Japanese media storytelling for a while you know has there been anything since end of the G1 universe from 2022 Peter do you do you know as I recall no so in the, the G1 universe was put out as a webcomic on the Takara website um, with the release of Dark Amber Leo Prime Lyo Convoy whatever the hell that guy was um, as a way to tell a story, it feels like a Legends comic. It's a weird side story. It is weird as hell. It made me literally go buy the toy just because of how freaking weird it was and fun. And again, it was kind of silly. You know, it involves eating dirt to get power, right? Like there's there's some humor in there for no good reason. And um, yeah, it was good. It was good. I want to see more of that. It's a bummer that we haven't gotten a lot of it since then because that was... That was fun. It made me buy a couple of figures that I greatly regret, but I don't regret the characters. The characters were fun. Yeah. And by and large, toy wise, everything started lining up real hard with uh, Legacy. I want to say it's kind of falling apart now. It's because we had premium finish, which Mm -hmm. was kind of like not really improved echoes, but changed echoes. But then we get the Beast Wars versus sets, which mm-hmm. were right back to LG. Like we took the toy and we fixed it. Here you can have it back now. Yep. Like the paint jobs are just, you know, it takes those um those kingdom toys that you kind of got them and you're like, gosh, this is Cheetor, but he looks kind of ugly in a way. And then Takara was like, Well, just give us a paintbrush, hold on, we'll give him proper eyes and put some more spots on him. Here's him back. And you're like, oh, this looks like Cheetor. It's cool. Cheetor. He's my friend. He's back. Yeah. Like yeah, we so. went from Titans mm-hmm. Return Trypticon through, you know, the, the the Power of the Primes and then what came next with Earthrise um, until, yeah, Anna, your point, Premium Finish started coming out. And then we started getting these these different Japanese decos. And that, that hopefully we continue to get more of that. Um, but again, it's still just a little bit of of i don't know sadness i don't know if that's a, a too extreme a word just on my part of of just more so just a longing for kind of just more outside the box yeah designs and ideas i agree with that we are currently getting as kind of a surprise like for the um earth spark toy line they're fixing some of those toys they're taking some of the deluxes from the Earth Spark toy line yeah. and releasing them in Japan with with better paint schemes. Like Nightshade was infamously like so much better looking. You know, we got Nightshade, we were like, "Ooh, this looks pretty good," and then we see the Japanese mm-hmm. release, and we're like, "Wait a second, that's the right colors, damn it!" And you know, we want that version instead. Um, so you know, they've done that. They're even like. I know I, I argued foolishly with Christian for a minute when they released pictures of their take on the Alita toy because Alita One from Earth Spark got released here as a warrior class toy that was very underwhelming. And then they released pictures of the Japanese release and it looked better and it definitely had more paint and stuff. And eventually, you know, Christian convinced me, yeah, they did actually retool it to upscale it from mm-hmm. a warrior to a deluxe um for the release because i think they just didn't want to release that mediocre toy in the toy line which is cool you know that they're fixing toys again um it's kind of a bummer as a collector though because you you buy the first version and the takara version come that's how it goes it's that it's that incremental improvement they get you and then they get you and then sometimes they get you again 
Oh, here's one you'll like, Peter. I know, I know you'll enjoy the dramatic capture series, right? We've got in two so far. We get the Decepticon Bridge with ah, better decos is a stretch. Like they're slightly different decos. Like the the shockwave is a different incorrect purple, you the know, type of deal. Is still wrong. Mega that Megatron. Still the, the wrong best, purple. That's the best Megatron yet for me. Uh, that's the one that is in display now. I don't like that face as much. I, I prefer the Siege as, face to the Earthrise face, but granted, the but, the deco is so much better. Mm -hmm. And when and when they really do Studio on. Series eighty six Megatron in a tank form later this year, we're gonna get another Megatron, and they're gonna redeco that one two or three times. So I'm better. fine. I'm fine with it. I think we got a little bit of a preview today with Zaron of what their Gen one Deluxe Megatron is gonna look like retooled from. I'm just spitballing here, but uh, anyway, yeah, they're they're gonna get you, and and I do appreciate the 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 dramatic capture or whatever series. The the the, the mainframe I got my my custom to about eighty percent, and then here it comes, because the magic that I put out into the world is I spend money and effort and time and literally literally cut my fingers up and paint my bathroom accidentally by spilling paint on the our nice counters and stuff and then once i've ruined everything around me and spent money japan comes out with something cool so the second dramatic capture is the autobot stage that has jazz and optimus with proper white parts over the not white parts from the earthrise release that everyone loved but now he's a little bit better incremental improvements and incremental then they took the freaking they took the freaking Teletran one out of the arc and repainted it where the mainframe parts are actually mainframe colors. And now they're releasing that. So, like, I did not want another Jazz. I did not care about an Optimus with white legs. But damn it, that mainframe, it's his proper Action Master colors. He's himself again. I... <sighs> Mine, yeah. I'm still going to press on with my custom. I'm happy that the set is coming out. I'm going to get the Optimus because I think that is the best version of that mold. It is. So that's fine. But everyone ran and bought Studio Series 86 Jazz when he came out a couple of years ago. And then when the 5-pack was announced, this one doesn't have clear plastic. So everyone bought the 5-pack to get Hound and the upgraded Jazz and the upgraded Sunstreaker. Cool. As soon as everyone got those 5-packs, they announced this Jazz which, in my opinion, should be Action Master Colors. To go with if, mainframe. Yeah, that would be to cool. To go with mainframe. If they, if, uh, they could have done Prime and Action Master Colors, and I still would have bought it and used it in my 1990 display. But, you know, I'll take what I can get. That Prime looks great. The mainframe looks great. The Jazz is Jazz. Let it, let it be. Maybe we'll get Action Master Decos at some point. Any, any Action Master love out there is, is love I need. Because, yes, please. But how much better would that release be if, in addition to the three-pack, right, there was also a Legends comic to come along with it to explain why in the world Mainframe is currently Teletran 1 or a computer? Like, maybe he's not even Teletran 1 at this point, right? Maybe he's just a computer. He's just helping them out by computering, right? That would be that so cool to have a little comic to go along and explain that. <laughs> And it, 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 yeah, it would fit in thematically with the legend stuff that's already come out, legend comics, and, and uh, yeah, my my mainframe custom, I chopped it down to where it's because his his bio says that he transforms into a standalone computer console, so I chopped it down to where it's not a big wide Teletran, it's mm. just a narrow like computer console on the wall, basically looks like an arcade cabinet, and it still transforms and it still does everything it needs to do. I just need to throw some paint on it, so it's not Teletran anymore. So I can have Teletran in the display. And mainframe in the 1990 display. Anyway, I digress. Will it all be mainframe <laughs> colors? Are you getting rid of the all the thing, orange? Okay. The whole thing is mainframe That's colors. That's kind of the... I, I'm a little disappointed by the compromise there. Because they went ahead and left the orange parts. So the whole Teletran mode can be orange. But the mainframe just has random orange parts on them. I wish they would have just gone all in and been like, he's a different computer. He's a balloon ride computer. It's named mainframe. <laughs> that would be fine. I tried to put that out there. They didn't want to do it. So, oh, well. Take what we can get. I, I did have, I don't know if it was Surge or someone else that commented that in Teletran 1 mode, the the new mainframe looks like a dude is, like, standing, like, like in a 
behind a bathroom stall door and you can see his feet. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I hear what you're saying about the Legends comics, Anna. I guess the thing that I thought about that would be neat to see and that we've seen from other properties is, you know, DC Animation has done several anime they've got a suicide squad suicide squad anime coming out um star wars has had several uh animes with with like they're they're not even doing like one story they're like all these different anime artists kind of reimagine star wars with with kind of, you know an anime flair i'd love to see transformers do that and, and not just like okay we're gonna do g1 optimus prime uh you know but in anime style animation but like, just like let some of these creators go a little bit wild with some of the designs, because that again to me that, that was the that's the thing I feel like I miss the most. I understand the silliness of, of the Japanese stuff and the different storytelling is is fun for a lot of folks, but to me, just the the, the wild designs of a freaking penguin that turns into an Autobot, um, you know, I, I want to see stuff like that again. We can have um, both, and, and I think if we got like an anime. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's yeah, not not a problem. I just yeah, give give us give us both. give us a little bit. Yeah, just give us a little bit of something. It feels weird to say that after we've got, you know, all the different toy lines coming out. We've got the comic book from Skybound, which has got a certain flavor. We've got Earth Spark, which has got a different flavor. Um, you know, you you just had Rise of the Beasts, you know, which is is the Bayverse kind of continuation. We've got Transformers One, which is its own thing. So we're not lacking for Transformers media. It's just again, it's that homogenization of the American slash Western audience um, that that just I don't know. I, I feel like as a fandom that was built on a toy line that came out of Japan, it it feels like we're we've lost that inspiration you know moment for a lot of these things i agree and i want to say that like what really did it for me with the legends comics and the legends releases was toys that had storytelling associated with them because this whole Legends time that we've been having generations figures you know siege earth rise kingdom yeah they made cartoons that were kind of sort of related to those toys but they were kind of a disaster and then we've gone into you know the legacy <laughs> Um, period where we had legacy and legacy evolution and legacy university and none of those really have a story that go with them what the legends toys did is they put stories with those right they made it and the story was goofy yeah. sometimes and it was serious sometimes but there was a story suddenly i want stories back with the toys like tell me why you know this current legacy wave that just got released has you know animated motor master hanging out at the same time as um, Slipstream, right? Like, what do they do when they're together? Like, do they hit out? Are they friends? Are they enemies? Do they argue? You know, just just make me a little bit of silly fiction to go on with the toy releases. I would be good with that. Or serious fiction, whatever. How did the GoBots, you know, end up here? Right, kind of right, right, right. There's that little yeah. thread. Like, they, they just gave us, like, a little hook. They gave us the guardian symbol on the flag. And it's like, okay, those are yeah. those are the GoBots, right? Those are the GoBots, but they're also the Minibot repaints. So tell us about it. I yeah. would love they're, to they're see not, a little storytelling. They're not GoBots. They're not they're not GoBots. Yeah, is there? That's not Pathfinder. Uh, it's not Pathfinder. They didn't give her a new head. But anyway, we digress. Because GoBots have nothing to do with Japan, right? Right, Peter? No inspiration at all. <laughs> I like GI Joe. I'm in. I'm into GI Joe. You've never touched so, any sort I mean, of machine robots. I, I think this is. This was a lot of fun tonight. This was very, very insightful to hear your guys' takes and opinions on this. Any kind of last thing to cap it off before we uh, wrap it up for the evening here, uh, Anna? We'll go with you first. I think. I think I just said it. You know, I really like the. Yeah. I like having the storytelling coming from Japan. I think it's very different. It's a very different style of storytelling. You know, I don't get as excited reading um, American comic style as I do reading manga. So I really would like to have more Japanese fiction again, um, just to kind of throw in the mix. Like you said, getting some more variety in there, you know, having everything produced 
um, in the U.S. is kind of dull compared to how it used to be. So I would really like to see some more Japanese storytelling. I think we will in the future. I think there's a little break, and I think we'll be back. Peter, any last final comments on your side of things? Uh, yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff tonight, and we went rapid fire in a lot of it. Um, and a lot of it is is well worth digging into uh, in in greater depth. So if if we've talked about anything or touched on anything that sounds even remotely interesting uh, as a Transformers fan or even as a fan of of whatever we we're talking about, I don't even know what we we're talking about. But go find it. The, the wiki can guide you. Other, other websites can, can get you a little bit deeper. Just run searches for things that sound interesting. Uh, avoid Rule 34 and uh, have fun with it. You know, um, Transformers is way more expansive than the cartoons you've seen. There are a lot of really cool things out there. Some of them are for not for everybody and some of them are for everybody. And some of them might just be for you. So check it out. Have fun. And, and honestly, you know, use us as a resource. If you want us to, to do an episode that goes into like, wait, Beast Wars Second, what the heck was that? Why isn't it just Beast Wars 2? It's Beast Wars Second. What What is going on there? What is this Beast Wars Second Galvatron that, that Phil's talking about? You know, let us know. We can do an episode on that. So if you get folks as fans want us to do that, shoot us a note. You know, you know, make sure you're liking, make sure you're subscribing, make sure you're telling your friends, it's great. make sure you set up uh, multiple accounts to go ahead and, and, and like and subscribe on the different accounts that you have. Join the Discord channel. There's a ton of great discussions that go on there on a regular basis. If, if you forget to turn off your notifications when a new Transformers cartoon, you'll have members of the Discord just live stream every single thought they have while watching a new Transformers cartoon that may have come out this past Friday in terms of Earth Spark uh, Season 2. Um, not that, not that I was like getting spam with Zaldron, uh, you know, little little messages every three seconds, but you know, whatever. Um, but but yeah, you know, let us know because we can certainly do that kind of thing and do a, a in depth review. I mean, if you want to see how in depth we can go, go back and check out our uh, episode with Peter uh, and Machine Robo. Um, but but yeah, um, appreciate everyone watching, listening tonight. Again, like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your family. Anna, speaking of Discord, what, what's going on with Discord and Book Club this weekend? Uh, we are still reading the second IDW universe. We are somewhere in the 30s. I never had the numbers memorized. I'm sure the moment this posts that Zaldarm will tell us what issues we're reading this week. It's like 36 and 37 or 37 and 38, something like that. Um, we're in the 30s. We're getting towards the end. And it's still, it's still an interesting story. So... Oh, you know what? That's a lie. That's not what we're doing this week. We're talking about Earth Spark. I am so sorry. I remember he has asked that we talk about the new Earth Spark, the season two or whatever came out. Which we'll see if I can manage to read that. Watch that by Sunday. I love Aftermath. I'm excited to see Aftermath. Aftermath is so much fun. Um. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching. Thank you for liking and subscribing. Um, yeah, we will see you next week.